final reading this morning is the gospel reading. John chapter 14, <coughs> verses 1 through 7. And this good news, listen for God's word to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the gospel of grace. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is my prayer that your Holy Spirit continue to abide with us in the midst of worship. And that Spirit would lead us to this table in just a few moments where we would be reminded what it is to be nourished eternally by bread and cup. So we offer this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's an exciting time of year. I think Keith and Janie Payton hosted something uh, pre-prom or something with the prom last night and almost felt like I was becoming an old man with the noise wanting to say, get off my lawn as all these cars kept coming by. But it's a fun time of year to be finishing up high school, graduating and just as a reminder, Ellie Christopher and Rylan Conway are the two seniors that we celebrate this year. And uh, we will have, we'll be honoring them on June 11th, but their Bibles will be available for you to sign or write a message of encouragement in. Uh, we're gonna have those available for you on the 28th. So you'll have a couple of Sundays, the 28th, uh, first Sunday in June, June 4th, and then on June 11th mm -hmm. we'll present those to them. But it's exciting. You really feel like you're leaving childhood behind and here comes adulthood. What's it going to be like? The freedom, the responsibilities. But what I want to ask you to do with me this morning is to travel back 13 years, not to the end of the senior year in graduation, but the first day of kindergarten. Do you remember how nerve-wracking that day was? And the question I have to ask, and the, the person that would be best equipped to answer this would be Jackie Elborn, because she's a kindergarten teacher. But I don't know if this question has an answer. On that day of dropping that little five-year-old boy or girl off to kindergarten for the first time and letting them go, is it more difficult on the parent or the child? I don't know that it has an answer, folks. Because for the child, all they have known, hopefully, is the security of home with mommy and or daddy and really maybe being the center of the universe for those f first five years. And the first day of kindergarten is like being dropped off in a wild jungle <laughs> with other five-year-olds that also think they're the center of all that has ever existed. And here they are, five years old, expected to learn ABCs and one, two, threes. And it's a whole new experience to watch mom and or dad walk away and it's tough on mom and dad as well believe it or not 
that's somewhat of the scenario we're facing in John's gospel today. It really is amazing that the author of this fourth and final gospel spends 20 to 25% of the stories just on Jesus' final teachings to his disciples before he's going to be arrested, crucified, dies, raised again. That's our celebration on Easter. And so Jesus in this story is preparing his disciples for his departure. Uh, he's going to be leaving them. And he's trying to get them not to be discouraged. He tells them early in this passage, don't let your hearts be troubled. In other words, have courage. To have courage is the opposite of having a troubled heart. And he's trying to instill within them the truth that his individual physical presence of God's kingdom has to go away in order that when he rejoins his father, the two of them together can pour out the Holy Spirit upon those who have believed in Jesus and form this organic, growing community called the church. The very first members of that church are the scared-to-death disciples. And the current members of that church, 2,000 years later, are you and me and our friends who are worshiping in other sanctuaries around this community and around the world. Jesus is telling his disciples that one reason that they need not be afraid, they need not have a troubled heart, is that where he is going to the Father, that there is a place that is prepared for them. In my Father's house, some of you know the King Jimmy version, King James version. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. I like it. The poetry of it sounds good. But in the actual text, it's, a, it's the most generic word that exists in the Greek language for just a place that you live, a place that you dwell, a place that you abide. Matter of fact, the word as a noun is only used twice in the entire New Testament. In this verse, and then later on in this chapter, in the 23rd verse, just the place you live, the place that you dwell. Now this is going to have a purpose, so hang with me. The verb of that same word is populating the entire New Testament. And the verb is minnow. Mane here for the noun, the place you live. Minnow means to abide, to live with, to dwell. Now I did some research this week, as I always do. And it's fairly agreed upon that ever nailing down what the word Minokin originally meant is lost to history. There is some consensus within scholarships and in, 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 among scholars that it was a Rappahannock Indian word that meant this is given to me or he has given this to me. But we don't know that for sure. So we have an English teacher with us today. She'll tell me if I'm guilty of a crime here. I'm a big fan of reader response theory when it comes to reading text. <coughs> Most of us think that when we read something, we have to discover what was the author's intention when he or she wrote this. Reader response says the text itself has the power inherently. You don't have to know what the author meant. The text can find a way to speak itself. So let me just take the word that our church has in its title and tell you my response to it, because I love it. It's not a Greek word, but I'm going to pretend like it is. Minno, to abide, to dwell, to live with. Another Greek word, kineo to stir into action. What a name for a church. To abide, to live, to dwell with a people that we stir one another to action. Heck, these first disciples might have called themselves Minokin. 
that Jesus is saying to them, I have dwelled with you, I've lived with you, and now you will live and dwell and abide with one another. And as the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be stirred into action to continue this good work of showing the light of the kingdom of God to others. Jesus' words should be received by his disciples with enthusiasm. He's going to go, but we're ready. He's prepared us. We're the next generation. But instead, the disciples, let's not be too tough on them. There are a lot of frightened kindergartners. He's leaving? What, what are we going to do? And Thomas is the one who speaks up when and Jesus tells them, you know the place to where I am going, the place that my Father has prepared for you. Thomas says, no, we don't know. Thomas, we basically see him in just three stories in the Gospels, and they're all found in John's Gospel. This is his least known story. We see him a few chapters before in chapter 11 when Jesus is going to go back to Bethany near Jerusalem and his disciples fear for his life. And Thomas says, let us go and die with him. I will go and die with him. So courageous Thomas there. All of us, I think, know his last story found a few chapters later in John chapter 20 where he's the one initially who didn't see the resurrected Jesus and he doubts. He refuses to believe that Jesus could be raised from the dead until a week later when he does see Jesus with all of his friends. And it is Thomas, the doubter, who makes the greatest declaration of faith in all of the Gospels when he says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. But Thomas in this story is a whole lot like us. You're leaving Jesus and you're telling us to trust that there, there's some place, but... But no, no, we, we need you to stay. And Jesus is insisting to Thomas and his other disciples that he has to go. And so when Thomas says, how do we know the way? How could we know the way? Jesus then responds with some of the most well-known words in all of the Gospels. It's another one of those eight I am sayings that he has in this gospel when he identifies himself as being one with God the Father. We had two of these last week. Do you remember? I am the gate for the sheep, and I am the good shepherd. Well, here today, we have words that are even more well-known. Sit with them a little bit. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I love those words. But sometimes I cringe at the way they're interpreted. When people move quickly past the first part, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and they say, no one comes to the Father except through him. Because what that eventually gets twisted to mean is that anyone who understands Jesus differently than I do doesn't make the cut. Shame, shame, shame. Shame on any of us for ever taking that from these words. Because what these words are saying is that the way, the truth, and the lie are not something that can be summed up in a book, not something that some institution called the church has cornered the market on, but that the way, the truth, and the life is something dynamic. The way, the truth, and the life is the divine personality. And any one of our individual understandings of Jesus is way too small to say that everyone else has to understand him that way. Just like God is always bigger than we could ever imagine and much more gracious than we could ever imagine, Jesus is God in the flesh. And so whenever we try to narrow down who Jesus is as to just our understanding of him, we have failed miserably. Jesus is always bigger. Jesus is manifested in ways around the world through stories that we've never heard because God's grace is pervasive. 
and ubiquitous. It is everywhere and it is energetic because it is love on the move. We've all heard that phrase, blood, sweat, and tears, right? Everyone knows that one? It means you've really worked on something. You've suffered to accomplish something. Blood, sweat, and tears. Have you ever thought about how Jesus' life was one of blood, sweat, and tears? Only let's reverse the order. Tears, sweat, and blood. Tears in Luke's gospel when he looks over the city of Jerusalem and weeps for them because they've lost sight of the bigger picture of how God's grace is intended to work in their lives. Weeps again in John chapter 11 when his friend Lazarus has died and been placed in the tomb even though he's about to resuscitate him back to life. Jesus sweats. Oh, he perspires profusely in the Garden of Gethsemane. I know some of you have probably misheard the story in Luke's version. He does not sweat drops of blood, but he sweats as if it were blood. It is an image to say he sweats profusely because the anxiety is overwhelming him in that garden. And then just hours later in the early morning of Friday, he sweats profusely in a suffering body as he carries the cross until Simon of Cyrene has to help and take over for the rest of the way down the Via Dolorosa to Calvary. And he bleeds. He suffers. And blood, that very thing we associate as the life force in its most basic element, Jesus' blood is shed. And then wildly seen after the story is that which saves the entire creation. As the Easter season begins to wind down, let's remember that Jesus is inviting us to get personal, to quit having God is some sort of object out there that we somehow define and say who God can love and who God can't love based upon our understanding and return again to the truth of our faith that God is a person, dynamic, the eternal subject. He acts upon our lives. We don't act upon his. I came across this wonderful description of what it means to be the church just this week. It was good timing. It's by a, a theologian who teaches at a university just one state away from us, Loyola University in Maryland, and his name is Frederick Bauerschmidt. You knew why I had to look down to get that name right. Frederick Bauerschmidt, prof <laughs> professor at Loyola University. And I don't want to mess up any of his words, so please hear these as our final words before we come to the table this morning. Again, his definition of the church, and I love it. If life in the church has taught me nothing else, it has taught me that I am the cross my fellow Christians bear, and my unfathomable neediness, my irritating insecurity, my uniquely personal weirdness, I am being born by all of you. And all of you are being born by me. And we cannot put each other down because while we are the cross, we are also the living stones from which God's house must be built. That is what it means to be God's pilgrim people. This is what it means to be the body of Christ. This is what it means to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is to bear the cross of each other in the mundane messiness of our common life as we walk the way that is Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, journeying together to our Father's house. Let us pray on the journey that God who is merciful, 
might have mercy on us all. Amen.